Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, hello. <laughs> Hi, it's nice to get to chat to you face to face. face, to face. Yeah, no, it's cool to see you. Excellent. How are you doing today? Tonight, it's tonight for you, right? You're in Europe. Yeah, it's um, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. No, it's good. Yeah, I had work today, so um, yeah, pretty normal day. <laughs> well, good. I guess normal days are, you know, worth it. Uh, cool. Well, thank you so much for jumping on this call. I really appreciate it. I, uh, yeah, I appreciate your flexibility and everything. I know it's late for you, so thank you. Oh, yeah, no, not at all. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about your thesis and everything. Yeah, um, I stumbled on your one of your blogs about Boshe a couple of a while ago. It's been a while now, I think back when I initially interviewed you um, and sort of, yeah, fell down the rabbit hole of reading a bunch of your blogs and got really intrigued into the work that you're doing and everything. And so I'm really excited to have the chance to, to speak with you and to talk to you, kind of pick your brain about that. Um, yeah, so that's awesome. Thank you for oh. being willing and for and no, for no, no, information I, out there. I love talking about it. So <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, yeah. So do you want to tell me just like a little bit about the work you're doing? Because you're in are you in Switzerland or Sweden? Yeah, I'm in Switzerland right now. Switzerland. What are you doing over there? Um, I'm working in a stable um, as a groom slash rider. Mm -hmm. Um, and so basically I came here because I, uh, I finished my degree on the West coast in Vancouver uh -huh. in business. And it's just, I found that there was nothing, there's really no classical riding over there. Right. And so I was like dying a little bit on the inside and, um, I had made a contact in Germany and basically that's my boss now. Uh -huh. So I came because I really wanted to basically progress um learning classical dressage and it, it's a bit of a mix but basically it's a little bit like um based on Nuno's uh teachings a little bit French classical um but also um we're quite influenced by this bullfighter and so sometimes there's like bullfighting oh. elements coming in as well that's really um, cool yeah yeah, I mean, there's just nothing like it in in BC that I've found. So. Yeah, absolutely. I um I can appreciate that for sure. I'm in Ohio, um, so it's a lot of like cow horse stuff, um, and then like oh, cool. okay. yeah, which is neat. Um, very cool. And then what dressage there is is very like traditional competition dressage. Um, yeah. isn't really isn't really my thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I definitely can appreciate feeling a little bit like, okay, I need to go somewhere else. Like, where are my people? <laughs> so that's awesome that you found a position that lets you explore that. Um, if you don't mind, kind of going to dive right in. I'd love to pick your brain a little bit more sort of about how you got it started on the route to classical dressage in the first place. Because um, it's definitely not something that I think you hear about as much um, growing up in the equestrian community. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Um, I started doing like hunter jumpers, mm -hmm. um, until I, I think I was 16 or 17 around there. Um, and then I had had a horse, but basically, I don't know. I just felt like things just didn't really, I had a lot of problems with her that they're like seemingly small problems, but for some reason, my trainer just couldn't. Like, I just couldn't solve them. It was mm -hmm. fine when she would ride, but I just couldn't, like, figure out why, like, things like why she wouldn't get the lead changes cleanly or why she'd, like, dive in around a corner or mm -hmm. why sometimes she'd get really, like, like a snake, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, just, like, little things like that. Mm -hmm. And I just... I just wasn't really satisfied because at the time it was mostly just like I was jumping but if I did flat work say you know you do like circles and you kind of go along the rail and then you do a diagonal maybe and transitions but I just I don't know I just felt like I would look at riders who I really um, respected mm -hmm. and I just had no idea how to get to that point point. Mm -hmm. 
and no idea what I was doing wrong. So since my trainer couldn't help me, I decided to kind of branch out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I had seen some videos online of like Nuno or, you know, like classical riders. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried a few things. I tried like um, California Western style riding. Yeah, that was quick interesting. Yeah. Um, I did try like regular dressage, <clears throat> but just in the lessons that I had, like just with the specific instructors, I just really wasn't impressed. Yeah. So I, I didn't like go further in that direction. Um, then by chance, a so who was my boss in Portugal? So he was a rider at the Portuguese school. Okay. For, like 40 years. Wow. And he came to Kamloops in BC, like a few hours away to do a clinic. And so I went to audit and then I just like asked if I could work for him. <laughs> Good for um, you. And that's basically how it all started. <laughs> awesome. That's really cool. That, that, that's sort of, I think that's a common thing, at least with some of the people I've talked to that have sort of fallen into this niche um, is a little bit of like a, a happenstance. Like you happen to audit that clinic or you meet one person doing it and you're like that, that is what I want to be doing. Um, that's yeah. really cool. What was it like work? Did, so did, were you actually in Portugal working for him? Yes, um, like as a working student um, uh -huh. for three months. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, no, I learned really a lot. Um, how would I describe it? The thing is, like, when, when I would watch him ride, it's just like the horses would become completely different within a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And that was just something I had never, ever seen before. Yeah. And so even when he was teaching me, it's not like he would, he wasn't really the type of person who would, like, explain everything in depth with the theory. Mm -hmm. He would just, like, tell you to do this and then do that and then somehow things would get better <laughs> and so you just kind of learn by doing mm -hmm. um yeah so I, I think I just kind of picked up a lot yeah just through doing and through watching him yeah absolutely I mean that's the most organic way to do it right like just actually interacting and being um with the horse okay yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's very interesting. What about the program you're in now? Do you feel like it's more theory based or are you still sort of in the like experimental learning by doing um, area? Um, for my job, then it's mostly just like doing, but um, I am actually also doing a, like a course, like a three year course. And that is more theory. And so that is really, really good because I'm really interested in that as well to okay. be able to like problem solve with a horse mm -hmm. then you can actually like analyze everything properly and know exactly what muscles you're working and why and so on um so that's really good and that's what got me on like reading all of these books for example that I've been writing about on my blog yeah um because they're kind of referenced in the type of writing that I'm doing but I find that people don't actually go and like read themselves what yeah. all these writers actually said. And they're very, there's people get, you know, very opinionated about dressage and classical dressage, but it's hard to make sense of what's actually true, I guess, mm -hmm. because I found like people just didn't read and didn't write about, or at least in English. Like, I think there's a lot more in other languages, but mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what, what made me, you know, start reading them and then start writing about them. So I could basically just get more clarity about, about how to work through problems with the horses. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes total sense. What's the course that you're doing? Um, it's, called um the escola de equitación so like school of equitation mm. um, it was started by manuel george de oliveira who's oh. the bullfighter who um basically met nuno and then kind of changed his riding based on what he saw okay uh and so now it's being offered by students of his in switzerland so that's what i'm doing 
Okay, that's awesome. That's fantastic. I'm definitely a little bit jealous. That sounds really like a, a valuable experience for sure. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's super interesting, but like I will be writing and, and talking about it. So no worries. Awesome. I'll be, I'll be looking forward <laughs> to that for sure. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. I think you're absolutely right. Um, so a little bit of background, just kind of on how I came into this. I'm really lucky and um, sort of stumbled into a trainer here in Ohio who is a part of um, Philippe Carl's École de Légerté and all of that. And that was all sort of by happenstance, like proximity and really fell in love with that. And so that was sort of my first introduction to like, oh, there's a different way of doing things. And like, oh, I don't have to, you know, um, follow what I see on TV and everything. Um, and so I'm more familiar. I kind of came at it from that uh, angle. And then I, um, so my, my degree and my background is actually in French and I lived in France for a number of years studying and whatnot. And so that's kind of prompted me to be really interested in um, the like the French old masters in particular. Um, and so I think that's how I initially stumbled on your site was because I was doing some work on Boucher and um, you had a, a fantastic series of articles about his work. So I definitely understand what you're saying when you say that like people don't actually read it or don't go back to the source because I've, um, had a number of conversations with different people. And yeah, it's definitely obvious to me that there's this gap um, in the education that we get. I think in particular, you're Canadian, but like as Americans or as, um, I don't know, it's different from what they have in Europe in terms of the schooling. And people don't expect you to read about riding. They don't expect you to ride. No, it's bizarre. Yeah, no, I know. I <laughs> know. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's bizarre. But you're so lucky that you speak French because then you can read all the originals. Yeah, that's what I'm working my way through currently. It's um, it's, it's quite the process. <laughs> it's it takes a lot of time, but it's definitely a worthy, a worthwhile thing. I've gotten a lot, a lot out of it, which has been cool. Yeah, oh, I cool. love it. Yeah, I love it. It's fantastic. Um. Yeah. So what I'm sort of working on right now um, to finish up my my undergraduate experience is, like I've mentioned to you before, a thesis. And I'm specifically looking at, um, in 2011, UNESCO named Dressage à la Française um, like an intangible world um, heritage, uh, which basically sort of just like, in, it's specifically focusing on the Cadre Noir in Somar. Um, but it, it's focusing on protecting that style of like classical equitation um, going forward. And so I'm trying to sort of the goal that what I'm taking, trying to take away and partly why I wanted to interview you and a couple of other people um, is to see if people who are actually current practitioners of classical dressage, um, A, whether they feel like that designation actually protects it. Um, because I think a large part of equitation and horse training in general comes down to the, the ability to evolve and to change like if you go back and read the books like things do change and as much as we can learn from the old masters there's also um we constantly have people like nuno who come onto the scene and you know take it to the next level and move it forward and so yeah. sort of how um current classical dressage trainers like yourself interact with kind of that do we keep it the same do we move forward is there progress to be made or have we reached like the pinnacle of um, our understanding and also just in general how you see classical dressage fitting into the equestrian community in 2021 and where its place is going forward on a larger scale so I know that's a lot but just sort of like <laughs> any like initial thoughts that you have on those topics um, I'd love to hear your thoughts sure um With the UNESCO, um, I guess, citing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm not saying I have any answers, I just like reflecting on it. Um, I would, I would imagine that, yeah, it would keep some part of it kind of static, because mm -hmm. then you'd have to like define exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. And so that would stay as it is at, at a certain point in time. Um, but the thing is, I, like from what I've seen and heard, even in the classical schools, they've really changed a lot. Um, even though they're supposed to be like, I guess, safeguards of like traditional wisdom and so on. 
I think the training has really changed, um, especially in the last like 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, for example, at the Spanish writing school, I, I, I have not been there, um, but I've talked to several people who've been there and they said that they were really surprised because they had actually, it was basically just normal modern dressage and they had seen a lot of hyperflexion hmm. and so on in the training. And, and I was just very surprised to hear that, but I'm not sure if it's influenced, for example, by like what people, you know, like people I think are really influenced by modern sport because it's what you see mostly on TV. Right. It's where the money is. And so people get used to seeing that and being impressed by say the really dramatic movements and so on. Right. Um, without understanding like the, 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 like what it means in a training way, like how the horse is actually moving its body and if it's correct or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if the schools have changed because they know people want to see that. Because mm -hmm. um, they don't really understand like the, the traditional teachings and, and like how to actually see say like a correct piaf or something and what that means for the horse and how it moves and so on mm -hmm. um, so it seems like there has been some change anyway even in these schools that are supposed to keep things like very traditional mm -hmm. so for unesco I think it'll really help, I think, just bring more attention to it, which would be awesome. To, you know, like spread, you know, just like the amount of people who are aware of it and do it. Right, right. And at least like raise curiosity about it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I think there will always be some kind of innovation though, because I think people they can't stand staying the same, I think. <laughs> I think yeah. are just not really like that. Yeah, absolutely. I can, so you would say it's almost, it seems like we've gone backwards oh, to a degree, maybe in the last 40, 30, 40 years in terms of like the, the, the Oteco and like the, the academies and everything. I don't know, I don't know about backwards, just, um, because I, I don't know if, if it was like backwards in time, if that's what you mean, like if it was like that before, but um, it seems like it has been influenced to like pressures of the industry, I suppose, mm -hmm. because the thing is like the, the traditional masters were funded mostly by like royalty. Right. Um, and I feel like they didn't really have like so much I, at least I think so much pressure I guess yeah they were tired to like do their job you know and like create something beautiful whereas even with the schools like most of them are governmentally funded mm -hmm. federally funded and you know they have to count like the number of visitors they have and so on kind of justify why they deserve that tax money and so on so if people are interested in watching, then like, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, you have to be sensational. You have to be, to be worth yeah. Absolutely. So you take away maybe like the private funding or however you want to phrase that. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't necessarily considered it from an economic standpoint, but I'm sure that there's pressure on the schools to, um, yeah, to keep the money coming in and to keep visitors engaged and entertained especially people who are used to seeing like hyperflexion and whatnot, maybe on TV or exactly. in the Olympics. And then they go there and like, well, that doesn't look like they did it, you know, exactly. without naming names. Yeah. I can see how that would be um, a tricky balance to walk. You know, if you're like the chef écurier, like that would be um, hard. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, my boss in Portugal did, bring that up as well he's like how do we justify spending so much Portuguese tax money on this um, yeah because they were really struggling to, to get um spectators and so on yeah I think um that would be really tricky especially if you are relying simply on like 
sheer numbers to justify and can especially considering kind of the the alternate time training timeline that the more classical methods take because that's always the big argument right like modern training you can get a horse to like grand prix or whatever by the time they're eight but then you know they their movement isn't correct and their body gives out by the time they're 12 whereas in the classical world it might take them till they're 18 but then they keep going until they're much older um but obviously the costs associated with that are much greater at the same time. Yeah. I mean, I think, I I don't know if there's such a big difference between classically trained and like in the timeline, I would say definitely a lot of competition horses are pushed to perform Mm -hmm. very quickly. And I think they're started. Yeah. Just faster essentially. Um, I have a feeling though, if you start fast, then you end up like spending more time. And so, I don't know, like classically wise, I know a lot of horses that are like seven, eight, and they're like finished, like they can do everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think it, it has to be like such a long time frame, but sometimes, yeah, yeah, it is. No, I mean, that makes sense. I've also heard different people say that, like, if you do take a little bit longer at the beginning, everything else comes quicker. So, you know, exactly. if you go slower for those first five years, you, you catch up, um, kind of down the catch up, um, but you make the ground up down the road because the horse is, has that solid foundation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I have heard um, that kind of tossed around. Yeah. It's interesting. I don't know what the... I mean, obviously it's something that I think enough people are passionate about, but I don't know what the best thing going forward is. Like, do we keep investing in the like academies and the schools and whatnot and kind of try and hold to that model? Does it need to be changed, Um, you know, made accessible? Is that what, I mean, in a perfect world if you know, we would see classical dressage at the Olympics again and like, you know, kind of break back in that way. But I'm not sure what the, um, the solution is. Yeah. The, the issue I see right now with the schools is like, I, I, I did visit the Portuguese school um, a few times with my boss. So that was really, really interesting. I'm sure and anyone, anyone can go, like it's actually totally open. Like it's part of a palace. And so you go into the palace and then in the gardens is the barn and so on. You can just watch some training, like anyone can go. Mm. Um, the thing is though, is like, if it's in one of those schools they don't really like pass on the knowledge to regular people, you know, like the only way I could learn is by, you know, hearing about my boss and then going to learn with him. But I I feel like the schools are a bit like they're just for showing Mm -hmm. and not really for like sharing as much as I would like to see. Right. So like, what about the day-to-day horseman, like kind of in his backyard? Who does he learn from? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's why it sounds like the, the course you're taking and programs like that are so valuable to sort of extend that knowledge um, to a greater variety of people. Yeah, exactly. Like we, and we have like every tons of different breeds as well. Like we have warm bloods. We've got, there's, um, it's basically like, um, a Swiss pony so imagine like a Criollo like the really long short legs <laughs> yeah yeah that's awesome <laughs> and then obviously like the Zitanos and um Pieris Spanish uh-huh. horses yeah or Lipitzan yeah it's a big mix <laughs> but here's the real question are there any gated horses that's tricky you know the thing is though because Icelandic horses are so popular in Germany, there are several students of Manuel George uh-huh. who do the same thing with Icelandic horses. Yeah. But it's always tricky because, for example, there's like some benefits you really get from um, diagonal gates uh-huh. in the way the horse uses its body. Right. That if they don't trot, then it's like, it's not the end of the world but it's a lot harder to to you have less tools let's say to mm-hmm. like modify them but 
I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in, in gated horses, but. No, no worries. I just, it's always kind of like funny to me. There's a couple of people I'm friends with on Facebook and stuff that have Icelandic horses. And I'm like, how do you, how do you do that? Like, how does that work? I don't, I don't understand. Um, kudos to them for, for trying it out and playing with it though. I, nothing but respect. Um, yeah. It just doesn't make the most sense to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. Like they're, they're, they have their niche and they're really good at that. And I mean, why, why use a horse that was bred for something completely different? You know. But anyways, <laughs> you know. Okay, cool, good for you. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think. I feel Did like. I miss- in your question I probably did at the I know end. I, I had like a, a second part a fo- or a follow-up rather um to that um because I know it's sort of a, a a vague idea that I'm um trying to 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 conceptualize um but yeah kind of running on the idea of how do we sort of bring this to um oh my audio went really funky there sorry about that um how do we bring this like to the everyday horseman or like to I don't know like pony club and 4-H and like the next kind of the next generation um of horse people um do you see like the reading about riding and like the books and texts and stuff that exist that are kind of out there for people to explore being a part of that going forward or do you think it's something that um maybe it's best left to like, maybe not like, I'm trying to think of a good way to phrase this. Um, Cause sort of what I've always like dreamed of is like, what if there was 4-H or Pony Club, but it was just for classical dressage and like you got to read yeah. like Boucher and Fluvanel and all of them, but like yeah. you're eight, wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, think where you could be by the time you were 30, like it'd be incredible. But then I wonder, is that really accessible or is that really interesting um, for the, the larger population? So then how do you take it and turn like flexions into something that's engaging for everyone um I don't know if you've if your school does anything like with helping at like outreach with kids or anything like that or if it's sort of limited no they do actually have a, the same course but also for kids like with ponies awesome. that's adorable. <laughs> <is> very, yeah <laughs> they literally post videos and the five-year-old kid is like with his hands up like oh my god stuff. that's so cute yeah um no that does exist I guess what I am equally frustrated and inspired by is that I just feel like it's such a desert in in definitely in Canada the U.S. is much better but in North America in general because even if there are people who do know how to do it they're really hard to find and somehow they just don't seem to share their knowledge in ways that I find like easy to access mm-hmm. you have to like know someone who knows someone and then happen to see someone ride and think oh wow they're doing something different um so that's kind of why I'm heading towards trying to bring this I think back to North America like I, I am in in um Switzerland right now but actually I'll be heading back to Canada in the summer Oh, okay. Um, and for me, it'd be really cool if I could start to kind of bring this back in a way that's like relatable. Like the thing is with, to, to make it more like accessible to regular people, mm-hmm. I think it's really important to help them like discover that it exists, number one. Mm-hmm. So I think having stuff online really, really helps. Mm-hmm. That's how I found you. <laughs> right yeah um I find a lot of horse people are very 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 difficult to find online yes um unfortunately um yeah my my partner is in social media like marketing and like in the business world and he is constantly um kind of teasing me and joking with me that horse people don't know how to do business and don't know how to use the internet and I'm like yeah if they could just do those two things we would be so much further along (laughs) No, no, he's right on. Like, yeah. Whoop, sorry. Um, that's it, that's what I'm thinking right now. Is is, I mean, the only reason I found people was through online. Like, mm-hmm. I found this clinic to audit because of Facebook. I saw it on Facebook, 
I found my place in Germany to work at through Facebook. <laughs> um, there you go. So, okay, there's like several ideas I'm trying to like put together it's here. It's fine, it's one, fine. <laughs> one is that, um, right, to make it more accessible to regular people. So sharing things online, including on social media or through writing about them, like on my blog and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, just generally different ways of um, making it more findable, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's one thing. And then to, yeah, I don't know, like in the future offer courses or something, like not just me, but other people um, that are accessible to people who have, say, a non-dressage background. Right. Um, that's based on and like informed by, say, traditional writings and like traditional writing and so on. Um, but I think it's important to also keep in mind that not every writer is like as nerdy as I am and they might not want to read the original texts. Right. And right. so I think there's also an important part of like the translating it forward. So the people who are really interested will read it, mm -hmm. but also to like, I think there's an important part in, in, in presenting old information in a new way mm -hmm. so that people relate to it better. Yeah, M the modernity of it and helping it to become accessible. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's totally, and that ties in nicely with the whole, I, so then if we're looking at something like UNESCO and, you know, saying that, oh, you know, French dressage is this cultural heritage and we have to protect it. That's great. And if we protect it, is it going to die because it's a stagnant thing and people aren't interested? So how do we yeah. sort of balance Okay, it's a protected cultural heritage that's awesome we want to keep honoring that and we want it to to progress forward and to be accessible um to people who maybe have goals other than you know the perfect 10 meter circle or whatever um yeah, yeah. no i think that's fantastic i love hearing that you're planning on coming back to to north america to uh share your the education you've received i think that's super important um the few trainers that I do know of kind of in America and I know a couple in Canada actually um people seem to really appreciate what they're doing the people that do find them get, really enjoy it and um are willing to, to come on board with it and embrace yeah. it so I think there's definitely a, the desire out there uh for that it seems like like it's a growing interest is mm -hmm. what I can see in North America it's just so new there yeah. that people are kind of like floundering a little bit or they're not really sure or like I'm just thinking back to when I was just like peeking around also and, and didn't really know too much about it I had just seen like I don't know you see like a video of like working in quotation or you see a video of Nuno and you're like wow but you don't really know anything else about it <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think that's really where you need that translation piece, like even for UNESCO as well. As, so if they're going to, I don't, I don't know how they're going to define like exactly what classical French is because there's a whole bunch of different streams, but right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're specifically trying to protect like the tradition at the Cadre Noir um, and like what they do there. But even that is sort of ambivalent. Um, yeah. In, at the, at the best of times so it's it's somewhat problematic in a lot of ways um in yeah. my opinion but i do think it's a step in the right direction and i think just the fact that yeah. it exists on that list is interesting because at the very least people are like oh what's that i'm gonna like watch the, the vi videos associated with it or whatever and kind of maybe kind of start to think about it um in yeah. a new or, or different way and i, I i'm just while I'm on this like um, thread in my head um, with the translation piece, I have noticed a lot of people have who kind of do this work of they offer courses or whatever. Um, they kind of frame it in different ways and this relates to the marketing piece mm -hmm. and, and like making the old kind of new so that people can relate to it better is some of them, they talk about keeping your horse sound. That's one thing with mm -hmm. classical training. 
uh, which is worth talking about. Um, another one is it's a completely different feeling. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> it's not comparable with modern dressage if you're, you know, often you see a lot of tension right. in the horse. And, the and so when riders sit on like a classically trained horse, they think like, whoa, this is completely yeah. different. Like, you really want to do this. That's another thing. They yeah. kind of like way to frame it so that they attract people. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you just talk about like learn this because it's classically French, it's it's hard to get interested. Whereas, so I'm afraid that if they keep it like that and just like a static, mm -hmm. that it might not draw as much attention as would be necessary to keep it alive. You know what I mean? I think yeah, I I do, and I'm thinking of um. I call her my bonus mom, but um, the woman who sort of got me started in all of this in the first place, um, she is very, very small. She's like maybe um, five foot two and like very petite woman. Oh, the audio did it again. She's a very petite woman. And she sort of fell into the classical training because a lot of the competition dressage methods she physically couldn't do. Like she wasn't strong enough to sort of like really sit that big extended trot and like hold the horse together. And so for yeah. her, the classical training really appealed to her because it was like, oh, I can have my horse be really light and kind of carry itself, even though yeah. I'm a very small woman, I can still ride these really big moving horses. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. Sort of how do you appeal to people in a way um, that feels applicable day to day in their in their own riding, not just because some old dude did it 200 years ago. Um, yeah, is super important for sure. So now it's it's um, UNESCO has recognized it. Yeah. Then is it does does it provide protection only for Saumur or or for other um, practitioners as well? Yeah, so it, Sommer has, a, they're protected under one entity, and then the school in Vienna, uh, the Spanish Riding Academy, is also protected, but it's under a different, um, its own thing. Um, and so I'm specific, specifically looking at the school in Sommer, just because that's, um, like, my appreciation of the French and, like, um, working in the French language and everything, but the yeah. school in Vienna is protected as well, uh, okay. which is cool, but also interesting. Like, why not the school in Portugal? Why not, you know, the the school, the other schools? Um, yeah. So that there, I think it, you have to go through a process and like be approved. And so, um, the Cadre Noir like actually proposed it to the committee in UNESCO and kind of got that designation for themselves. Um, yeah. And so there's kind of like an application process that has to be completed to, to get that protection. Um, but then, I, I mean, I thought in Saumur, for example, I'm, I mean, historically, they were very anti boche actually, I mean, because Philippe Carl, for example. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's there. Yeah. They, sorry? Officially, he didn't. Right, right. Um, yeah, they, I think, so it used to be that what there was the school at Versailles and that was like the classical school and then like Somar was like the, the military academy, right? And they sort of, they sort of split. Um, yeah, and so no, technically like a Bocherist like approach wouldn't be protected under dressage à la française like designation. Um, yeah. it, it's, it falls under a slightly different. I'm just looking at it more from like, what's the whole cultural impact of these texts um and how they've accumulated in kind of this um appreciation of a classical dressage yeah. But yeah my understanding is that the the somar is is very different from yeah what boucher would have um preached or taught yes <laughs> although yeah. yeah even though i've read uh, like a fair amount about him i'm still I think you have to read the original French, honestly, because the he just changes things a lot throughout his his career. It's um, very confusing. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I've only read 
more of his some more of his later stuff. I haven't read a lot of the like original um, work that he's put out, um, so I can't speak as much on the the change. But I do know that it's pretty significant, like almost one eighty um, in his thinking. Because wasn't yeah, he so that brings this? Yeah, wasn't he? He was involved in an accident, right? And then that sort of mm-hmm. shifted the um, the mindset. Yes, because he lost all the strength in his legs, I believe. He couldn't use his legs. Right. Um, and so he, like before, he was um, putting a lot more emphasis on using hands and legs at the same time. Right. And then afterwards, I think he just wasn't able to do that. <laughs> um, and so he started using them separately more and, and then Jean-Tan became Jean-Tan more precise. Yeah. Yeah, the, the classic like without hand, hand without leg, theories and everything that, personally, I find that to be a very, a, a cool, cool, that doesn't sound very academic, but a really interesting, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's super cool, uh, an interesting and useful uh, way of approaching it. But yeah. So like in the teachings that um, you're learning now and everything, like what, I mean, obviously Nuno and everything, but who, what, who do you feel like you are drawing on the most? Oh my gosh. Um, it's really hard to like attribute things like only to one person, yeah. you know, cause we all kind of learn from each other and then. Right. Um, Um, hmm. I would say day to day, we do a lot of voucherist things. Like uh, we do a lot of mobilization and inflections. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is useful for you to know, but I'll, I'll just throw it in anyway. Um, so our horses are voucherized. However, I've noticed now, um, Things can go very wrong when you have, for example, like students who don't do things like exactly enough. Mm-hmm. And then the horse is a school horse every single day. Um, the horses can then have some, some serious issues because like if you're dealing with flexibility of the neck and you make it flexible in the wrong way or in the wrong part of the neck or too much, then it makes it very very difficult um so i'd say voucherism is it can be really really good when people do it precisely Mm -hmm. uh but like anything else it it can be not used very well and then you have really big problems after Mm -hmm. um so i would say I did, so I read Steinbrecht and I was so skeptical at the beginning, but honestly now <laughs> I'm finding it extremely, extremely useful like to, to go back and to um, read through his explanations because he's incredibly precise, like mm-hmm. the right paragraphs and paragraphs about a tiny detail. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm finding it, it's extremely helpful to be able to understand the, the problems that come up. Yeah. Um, and to balance that with with Boche is is really really useful actually. Okay. Uh, even though Steinbrecht like hated Boche and he right. he does these like horrible attacks on him at the end of every chapter of his book. <laughs> <laughs> he just He's really got to like, drive that point home. Salt, like, okay, yeah. Um, I get it. You hated the man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I would say at the moment those are the two biggest. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And maybe um, there are some books that I haven't like written about because I just haven't had time, but um, let me just get this. Uh, I should do this one as well. So one book that I read that I absolutely love is um, by Miguel Tavora, okay. and he was Nuno. Um, 
his book I find incredibly good more for uh, the attitude, I guess, that you, you would have with the horse. Mm -hmm. And that he explains that how to do everything so logically and calmly and, and not to, you know, uh, transmit your excitement to the horse, I suppose, like, and not to develop movements out of excitement like some people for example train Piaf by making the horse nervous and excited because then it'll start prancing you know yeah um but then that's actually very common or like if they want the horse to go faster extend a trot anything then they'll do it with more emotional energy than calm energy mm -hmm. but then that becomes very difficult because then uh anytime the horse then gets excited about something it will go faster <laughs> and so on um, right. <laughs> so you need to like train independent of emotion because sometimes the horse will have emotion right and you don't want to have that attached to certain movements that makes sense yeah so that i found really helpful too honestly it's just like as i go i just pick up whatever i find useful that's awesome so though. maybe those three and Steinbrecht and uh, Boucher. That's awesome. Thank you. I, yeah, I love, I love hearing that. Um, yeah, I haven't interacted a whole lot with Steinbrecht just because I've been sort of mostly yeah. through school, but like really in this like French, French, French um, mode. But I definitely like. I know wasn't it Nuno that could quote like to the page, to the paragraph, both yes. Steinbrecht and Boucher. And so yeah, I'm definitely yeah. eager to um, to start looking into some of that. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time because I know it is, you probably still need to like have dinner and all of that stuff. Um, but just like, no worries. Um, I just out of curiosity, like personal curiosity, like right now, currently living, who are some of your favorite, um, like dressage practitioners or like the trainers you look up to the most? Um, hmm. It's, it's. The thing is, some of these people I've never met personally, you know, yeah. so it's hard to say. Um, one person I really respect is um, Bettina Drummond in the US. Yeah. Um, and I interviewed her not too long ago, and, and that was, yeah, it was fantastic. And, and I really appreciate, I guess, that she's very practical, but also there's a lot of depth in, in her writing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that goes beyond just like technical writing. Uh, I would say Nuno as well, but I would say I don't understand him 100% yet. And he was very, like, volatile as a person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I like how he was able to work with so such a big variety of horses. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and his openness to be able to combine different styles. Mm -hmm. That's something that I find really, really useful. Um, who else? I would say my boss in Portugal. The thing is, these people are so quiet. You just never hear about them otherwise. But um, people like my boss in Portugal they really know so much and then they just go about it like as if it's nothing. Um. <laughs> yeah, I was listening to one of Warwick Schiller's podcasts recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. He says, some, one time someone introduced him as like one of the world's leading horsemen. And he was like, no, the world's leading horsemen are at their barn on their own property doing their own thing and you've never heard of them. And I think yeah. that's really true. The, the, the best of the best are not out there they're just kind of quietly going about doing their thing without anyone really recognizing it um, sadly yeah. yeah it's a shame it's a damn shame but yeah so I, I understand what you mean yeah um and then gosh that's all I can think of at, at like at this very moment no oh, that's great I was just kind of curious um who you personally were kind of looking up to and everything yeah I mean also another thing with that is 
I, I guess I always try and like look for things that I can learn from or that are useful for me. And so I find there's useful things in, in like tons of people, you know? And so it's not like I'll um, adopt a hundred percent of what they teach. It's just like, I'll try it out and I'll see what I find really useful and then I'll keep that. And, and so for example, like um, I used to be really, really into work Schiller. Like I used to fall in the lot and I went to his clinic and so on. Um, and I found some of it really, really useful. And I think he puts things, he's, he's quite good at explaining things and making like little phrases that you'll remember mm -hmm. about training. Mm -hmm. I really like that. That's very useful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for example, his concept of, um, he has this one video, for example, of like, how do you stop an out of control horse or something? And it's with the gray end illusion. And it's basically how, if you train a horse properly, then they never get to the point where they'll like lose control because you've already worked out everything on the way there right right um you know like little things like that are, are really good so yeah i there's lots of like for example monty roberts again yeah. i used to learn with him um then i found it kind of limited but like i there's so many good things that i learned there like learning more with the body language of the horse and how to work with that and where the point of balance is from the shoulders and where to place your attention and so on. Really, really useful. And I still use that, for example, catching horses and so on. Yeah, for um, sure. They're... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I just look for like the most useful thing, I suppose, from, from lots of people. I can definitely appreciate that. I think that's... um. A smart way of going about it. I think it's very limiting to say I only follow this person's um, dogma. Or I only do this because um, you miss out on all this other, all these other great methods and ideas that people have. And there are certain situations or certain horses that need a slightly different approach. And so the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better off you are. So exactly, yeah, yeah definitely exactly. appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, thank you so much for talking. I really appreciate it. This has been super fun for me. It's always cool to get to talk to people that um, are into this and like, don't look at me funny when I say, so you know, Boche, and they're like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been great for me as well. It's same. I mean, it's same here. It's because I'm super nerdy about this. And yeah, there's not as many people as I'd like that uh, are equally as nerdy about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that um, I was like, I like dipped my toe in the water. I was like, oh, this is, looks fun. And now it's all I talk about, all I think about. <laughs> Everyone's sick of me. <laughs> so it's nice to have a new audience. Uh, you can always message me. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I they're like oh good I'm really glad uh yeah no it's fantastic so thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and chat with me I really appreciate it um 